Web3 Nomads. Everywhere jobs, for anywhere people. Right, so we just finished recording with uh, Tyler Dank, the co-founder of Beehive. Beehive is one of the fastest growing newsletter platforms, not just in the kind of crypto and Web3 industry, but um, across all industries at this point in time. We, we originally started on, on MailChimp, but um, they quickly turned into the Thought Police and wouldn't let um, crypto newsletters um, start publishing through their platform. I mean, Mazari uh, got taken down and they were using MailChimp. So we made the switch. Uh, we went to Substack, which nothing on Substack. It was it was really great. But we're just we're in this we're in this period now where we're just going to be focusing on like hyper growth over the next twelve to eighteen to two years. Um, so we were taking a look on the market. What is what else is out there? We seen Beehive and we take, took a look into it, realized that Tyler um, was one of the early contributors to the Morning Brew and particularly he focused on the growth and kind of social and monetization aspects of the Morning Brew, um, which is which is a newsletter, I think of around 3 million people at the minute. It got bought by Business Insider for many, many millions. Um, so yeah, they made a, a super successful newsletter with all these kind of growth tactics, um, referral schemes and all that kind of good stuff behind the scenes and a good CRM and things like that. So so we took the plunge um, and we wanted to have Tyler on just to kind of discuss his journey, what it's like working at Beehive now, where they're at, some of the features, because um, we know we're in this kind of creator network, I suppose, in the crypto and Web3 space. So, And we also see there's a lot of people that are using a, a Medium or a Substack or something like that. So we wanted to kind of showcase the product this isn't kind of a sponsor i wish it was <laughs> if anyone does want to sponsor reach out um but yeah we just wanted to have him on it's a great story um there's loads of really cool tips and tricks in this as well um so if you, are, you do have a newsletter or you are publishing articles or content and things like that and you want to start growing an email list um turn it into a business maybe um yeah i'd recommend taking an taking a look at beehive you can check our link for beehive below um if you could really help us on this kind of journey to hyperscaling this year that'd be really greatly appreciated we've got lots of fun kind of incentives happening behind the scenes on the newsletter at the minute uh, and those are only going to increase over the year so um if you'd like to do that the link is below in the description but other than that just enjoy the episode all right looks like we're we're working and all live so um today we're joined by tyler from beehive um the fastest growing newsletter platform in the space. And if you don't know who these guys are and you call yourself a content creator, then you might need to find a new job. So Tyler, thanks for joining us. I know I've been pestering you. And the first question is, how was the salad dressing? The salad dressing, yeah. Uh, this is take two <laughs> of the podcast episode. We tried to go last week, ordered sweet green, didn't have any salad dressing. So we had to cancel because I had to get a second dinner and it just threw off my night. So we are back, take two. And I have a credit to Free Green, so we're good to go. Sick, sick. And also, um, people won't people won't know this, but the the last message I received from you was, "I'll be two two or three minutes late. I'm just answering some support tickets." <laughs> so you guys, are you still are you still manning the support ticket side for for the project? No, so not personally manning it. We we have uh, Darwin, one of our support and account managers, running it. But I like to like dive in every now and then, help them out yeah. with the volume of tickets. We've been growing very quickly, and so tickets have skyrocketed. And I also think it's like very humbling to see what users are complaining about and like where we can improve the product. So one of those like cliche things that I tweeted a few months ago was like how great of a practice it is to have founders spend like five to ten hours a week in the support channel. But it definitely keeps you humble and aware of everything going on in the platform. Yeah, agree. I've heard I've heard a couple of kind of I think there was some guys on Lenny's podcast and things saying stuff some exactly what you were just saying there. The only <laughs> it's quite hilarious, really. Complete opposite ends of the spectrum. But the last person I heard in the in the whole crypto and web three space that was doing that was SPF and uh <laughs> we all know how that turned out. But um can't can't imagine that's gonna be the same. The same uh I hope yeah, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we like to kind of get into a bit of an origin story on yourself and how, how you've kind of came to where we are now with the product and things. So I was just trying to throw across to you is um, 
what was what was what's the background on yourself as a, were you entre- entrepreneurial as a kid what, what was the kind of clear or muddy road path to kind of where we are now yeah i definitely say more muddy if anything but going back <laughs> to college me and a few buddies started a company that connected entrepreneurs and startups to software developers the thought was on college campuses like amazing computer science programs amazing entrepreneurship in business schools very little collaboration between the two so we tried to bridge that gap. Um, students are like a pretty tough market because they don't have any money and they're very fickle. And so that was not like a billion dollar success story, but it got me and my two co-founders the ability to like teach ourselves how to code. We built a platform from scratch, came self-taught developers. We got users, we growth marketed, we did content, anything to really grow the user base on like a student budget, AKA like for free. And also just built the work ethic of when a lot of our friends were tailgating on the weekends, we would sponsor different university events at like Harvard, Toronto, uh, Northeastern, and like basically sleep in a college like uh, dorm or whatever to like sponsor these events and just try to get users. And so work ethics, startup experience, whatever. We ended up shutting that down and I was living at home classic in my parents' basement, just trying to figure out what was next. And one of the co-founders of Morning Brew, Austin Reef, is from Baltimore, and he reached out to me asking if I had any interest in building like a social share feature in the bottom of the stories in the newsletter. And he's like, do you know how to do this? It'll, I'll pay you like $3,000. And I had like $4 in my bank account at the time. And so <laughs> I kind of lied and was like, yeah, I can figure this out. No problem. And almost quit probably five or six times during the, that like three week period of trying to figure that out. Eventually figured it out. And he goes, we have so much more work for you. Like we don't have an engineer on our team. And so while you're finding a job, if you just want to work remote on contract, we can toss you different initiatives. And so my goal was never to join Morning Brew. I was just kind of doing it while job searching. And towards the end of summer, he reached out and was like, we actually, like we've made a ton of progress. You've been crushing it. Do you want to join full time in New York? And so I had a girlfriend, an apartment, everything in Washington, DC, and kind of dropped all of that to move to New York joined Morning Brew as the second employee back in 2017 and basically ran everything from product engineering and growth for the first 18, 20 months before we hired another growth person and a few more engineers. Did the referral program, the email templates, the website. We built a content management system from scratch. We built an ad management platform. And then obviously the story of Morning Brew is pretty well told now, but from when I joined around 100,000 subscribers, scaling to three and a half million when I left and then acquired by Business Insider. And so that was kind of my, as a 22, 23 year old, managing $500,000 a month in acquisition, building tools with like Austin and Alex having the confidence to let me test different things and build things on my own. As like a 23 year old was like an unreal experience and I'm forever grateful for that. And the learnings that we took from that Morning Brew success story really apply that into building a platform that is now Beehive. And that's kind of like the impetus for everything we're building today. Wow. Yeah. 23, 22, 23 year old. Jesus. I'm only, I'm 29 and that seems like young to me. Were you kind of just given an open, open book on that? They must've obviously seen something that you seen some kind of light in you being able to just kind of be put set to your own devices and just go off and build. Was there any, like the products that you were building for growth and, and social what was there any kind of reference point at that point? Because now with you guys, you've particularly now with Beehive, you've set the standard of what that, that them kind of products look like. But I suppose back in the early days, there kind of been much much to go off there. there. There was definitely predecessors to us. So we always looked up to the skim. They started, mm. I think, three or four years before Morning Brew and had a referral program before us. They had like the skim ambassador program. They had a great newsletter that had like the social share and like other kind of gimmicky things to help stimulate growth. And so we looked at them a lot. We were also in New York and just had different connections. I think Alex and Austin were like pretty plugged in with like the Michigan and like media network of New York to understand like best practices, different newsletters, different media operators. And so we were a bunch of like 23 to 25 year olds just taking meetings, grabbing coffee with people who had built newsletters or media businesses before and just trying anything. I think where we did a really great job at Morning Brew was have an open-minded mentality to try anything. And so we were just very scrappy. We built the different tools and data mechanisms to understand what channels worked well, 
what wasn't going to work well, but we had an open mind to try anything. And so that experimentation worked really well for us, where I feel like most established larger companies, very bureaucratic. You have to run it up the ladder to see if you can get mm -hmm. approval to spend X dollars. And we were like the wild west of trying anything. And so that <laughs> gave us a lot of like really interesting key learning. Yeah, what, what's interesting, I was listening to completely different, not exactly too far off topic, but I was listening to a Rick, Rick Rubin interview the other day and he says whilst he's producing, um, any suggestion that gets put forward until you test it, you really, really don't know the outcome. If someone's kind of all high and mighty and thinks, oh, that'll never work. You don't know what works until what works. And I think hearing that from him and then hearing that from you guys, it's just something that we're going to try and, lean in heavily too because sometimes we can get kind of tunnel vision on how we perceive to actually grow but uh yeah i think that's really good and i exactly agree with what you're saying if it was kind of a big bureaucratic machine from like old media um there's no way that have had the flexibility to try some of the stuff that you you guys did was there any kind of stuff that you thought was gonna really work that didn't or and i suppose the flip side of that any stuff that you threw out there that was like this will never work. Let's try it. And then really, really stuck. Was there any kind of anything you kind of remember from that? I think like big picture, one thing that scared the shit out of me was saying like, I like the, not on the growth side, but on the content management system, like the CMS that we built, like we had looked at a bunch of other CMS tools to create the newsletter. And a lot of them were web-based. And so for a WordPress or for some sort of like web flow plugin, and we were just very different as like an email first entity where we needed the output of the template and the new and like the CMS to be a perfectly crafted like HTML email that looked good in all these different mail clients, which is very different than a blog CMS for WordPress. And so as like a 23 year old, I was like, what if I just built this from scratch, like <laughs> literally from like a empty code base. And like, I'm, I have my insecurities as like a self-taught developer, like didn't do computer science. Like everything is like, very scrappy taped together works, but like not perfect. And even if it was closer to perfect, I would never think so. Cause I, I just don't know any better. I'm like the scrappiest <laughs> engineer of all time, I'd say. And so I was like always very insecure about that. And like just being hired by a company and being 23 and like kind of like out of our league being like, I think I'm just going to build our own CMS from scratch. And I think <laughs> it'll be able to do better than all of these other content management systems that exist on the market. And so that was like, a pretty big risk where I convinced them. I was like, I think it'll take three, four months. And then our writers will have a tool to actually type in and write the stories every single day. And if it goes well, it will streamline everything we do. Before that, we were copy and pasting into like a code file and like sending it on like MailChimp at the time. And so that was like something I was hopeful would work, but like big picture had so many insecurities and worries that like that was gonna, I was gonna be three months in and hit a roadblock that I hadn't thought of. And then it was just three months completely wasted. And just like the guilt of like a small six person team spending three months of my time to realize that it was actually a terrible yeah. idea would have been pretty tough. Uh, so that's something I, I kind of didn't think was going to work and it ended up working. And I think they've since moved off that CMS, but it lasted from my first year until acquisition. So like it got them wow. acquired and then they eventually <laughs> hired more experienced engineers than myself and, and rebuilt it or built like a new tech or using some other tool. So that is an example of something that did work, fortunately. Um, <laughs> stuff that didn't work. I mean, we just tried every for on the acquisition side, like again, like the wild west of like any channel that we thought was under invested in, or we could get an like an edge by being early, we would try everything. So Facebook stories, when that launched, like mm -hmm. everyone rightfully so was like, that's such a dumb idea. No one's going to use Facebook stories or because the ad format is so much different than Instagram stories or Facebook feed, like for larger bureaucratic organizations, they have to get their designers, like map out new assets and try it. And we were like, let's just spend three hours in Photoshop, create a bunch of assets and be like the first ones on this platform. Yeah. And so we would try, we did that for Snapchat. We did it for Reddit. We did it for Quora, any sort of like ad manage, ad platform. When they rolled out a new medium, we would be as quick as possible to test it. And then as you would expect, like Facebook stories didn't work super well because no one used that feature. But we were like very quick to jump on any ad platform. Um, so that was kind of a learning where I think some you'd be able to find a little bit of arbitrage and, and make out like a pretty good ROI on your investment. But plenty of other times where it just fell flat on your face. But we had the open mentality of 
being okay with trying and failing as long as we failed pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we're trying to focus kind of chopping these kind of long form videos up into short form now, because we know the kind of short form battles happening across YouTube shorts, TikTok reels, and Elon Musk's even hinting at bringing back Vine on Twitter. Um, so again, I completely agree with what you're saying there. Just trying to be first. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Just try and stuff out. Do you think like being so kind of full of youth and optimism and maybe like some positive naivety at the time was allowing you to just say, fuck it, let's let's just go and try it? Do you think you did the same kind of scrappiness now or... Do you think those ideas wouldn't have kind of washed if you had a bit more <laughs> experience on your shoulders? I, I mean, I think Beehive's like fairly close. Like we've adopted a lot of that <laughs> where we are 14 people that are just like anything to optimize and, and test different ways to either grow, f- make the tool work better, make the platform run better. Like we are a very fast moving organization. I think almost like sometimes a little bit too fast where we will like fire from the hip, launch features, not think things through entirely. But like we'll solve one problem and like maybe create another problem because of that problem we solved. <laughs> but like we move very quick. And I think more often than not, it's a huge advantage for us. Yeah. We're also like so plugged in, like not just me, but I'd say more than half the team very active, both like on Twitter and all of these other message boards. Anytime that we're mentioned anywhere, we're getting like real time alpha. Of like we launch something, 45 users love it, 15 users hate this about it we can like DM those 15 users. Like we're, we're not lo- too large to be able to do those like small things that don't scale. And so getting like one, building the relationships with those users and then also being able to collect those data points and iterate quickly. Um, I think it's very different than how most organizations would run. Um, I mean, I was at Google for a bit before, for like 10 months before starting Beehive. And from my 10 month sample size of working at Google, very, very different pace than how we are operating i can't imagine you working at a big cruise liner <laughs> trying to either <laughs> i thought that I, I did the morning brew experience when we were three people and then we scaled it to 35 and it was a success and i was like that's a really cool experience and i knew that i was always a small company startup guy yeah. but i had an opportunity to join youtube music and google and i was like i've seen it small time it'd be really cool to plug into like one of the tech behemoths and just see what that organization looks like at scale. Um, but it was also during COVID. So I was basically in my mm-hmm. room in Brooklyn by myself working on a laptop and like an organization <laughs> I was just getting used to work from home. And so I couldn't have stuck out more as someone who just didn't belong at all or never really get it. Met cool people, had a great time there, but I didn't feel super productive and, and definitely a different pace of work than I'm used to. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. So, um, so there's a lot of creators in the whole crypto, Web three, NFT, DeFi space, particularly the area that we tend to operate in. And um, we've just made the shift over. We originally went to Mailchimp, being idiots, and realized that they they have the fall police operating over over there, and uh, you can't really talk about crypto. <laughs> and we moved over to Substack. We, like nothing against Substack, we, we enjoy the platform, but um, we think that the content's at a level now of consistency and quality that we really needed to plug into something that was going to really help amplify the growth. Um, and obviously, you guys just seen the natural fit, hence why we wanted to kind of chat and see if there's anything we can kind of take from the conversation to apply to the newsletter and also kind of push some of the creators that are in this space that I know are using um, other kind of newsletter platforms to kind of take a look, um, hopefully shift them over. <laughs> but so can we kind of just get into the product? So basically just like a high level of what Beehive is, and then I've got some kind of features and other kind of questions around the product. Yeah, for sure. And, and we're getting to the point now where we're launching so many features where it's kind of, I always forget a few different things that we have <laughs> in like the arsenal. Um, at, at its core, we are a newsletter platform that doubles as like a website and blog. So you can set up your own custom website. You can sync to WordPress or Webflow or a custom built site. But by default, you can plug into our web infrastructure. It's like very performant. It's quick. It has a lot of features like search, content tagging. We're launching custom pages, custom navigation, a bunch more like site builder features in the next few weeks. Um, 
And then the whole site is optimized for newsletters in the sense of like collecting emails and like SEO optimized for content and indexing on Google. And so we have the web infrastructure, we have the email ecosystem where you can customize. Yeah, so that's the website right there. Um, we have a few different layouts and, and you can search. You're using like the featured post at the top um, and then there's search over there. Um, there's different like email acquisition tactics. So obviously there's subscribe forms everywhere. You can do pop-up forms on individual stories. You can email gate your content as well as like a little bit more aggressive. On the email side of things, custom suite of being able to, without needing coding or anything, you can change the layout and background, the fonts, the colors, the style, the buttons, how quotes look. Um, anything that you want to edit in your newsletter, you can do with like a no code editor um, and you set it. And we actually have a new editor launching tomorrow. I don't know when you're going to release this episode. So hopefully it's definitely out in public. Um, yeah, it be. <laughs> that's a whole nother story too. Like this editor that you're showing now, when we built this way back when as a side project, we had like, you know, there's like 10 or 15 popular editors to choose from. And we had like, here's the ideal editor, but it would take six months to build. And, you know, before you have a single user, you don't you know, like whatever the saying is, like, if it's perfect, it's probably late. And so we mm. didn't want to build the perfect. So the editor we went with, I'd say is like a five out of 10. And it got us from zero to 100K MRR with like a mediocre editor, which is crazy because like we are a writing platform. And so I think that is a pretty interesting insight, but we have a brand new editor that I think is like top of the line launching this week. So if you're listening to this episode, it should be out. Um, but yeah, then we have a bunch of growth tools built into the platform. The referral program that I mentioned building at Morning Brew was the inspiration behind the referral program that we use in platform. So you can spin that up and basically have more or less the same infrastructure of Morning Brew's referral program in your newsletter. We have a recommendation feature where you can recommend other newsletters. They can recommend you. Uh, we have a lot more in this area coming soon, but recommendations is just like a pure network effect play of you can find other newsletters in the crypto space or DeFi or wherever if it's not competing or even if it is competing it's just a great way where you can leverage the growth of other newsletters and we see newsletters growing by a thousand two thousand subscribers a week of very high quality subscribers through recommendations so that works really well um and then just like a bunch of email stuff. So we have email automations. You can do drip campaigns. You can do when someone upgrades to premium, you can send like a bunch of automated emails there. We have A-B testing subject lines to optimize the open rate. Um, yeah, yeah, those are a few of the top things under the analyze tab. We have, yeah, I'm just now, now that you have this up in front of me, I can just use that. But like we have <laughs> these like different deep dive reports of like at Morning Brew. And I think I announced this like when we, when we launched the feature. But at Morning Brew, we had all of our email data in one platform, our website data in a different platform and all of this other types of data in like different silos. And we paid three or four different firms, like a ton of money to extract all that data out, put it into like a data warehouse and then create like dashboards that were useful for us. So we've structured our data from day one with that in mind. And so you get all of these like subscriber reports and post reports and analysis out of the box. And so like, it really is like looking at what we had built over three and a half, four years at Morning Brew and then working backwards and like, how would we build that into a platform from day one? And that is kind of like what Beehive has become. And there's a lot more coming. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're two posts in from migrating over. So we're really diving deep into what we can actually use on the platform. Uh, Dan, now a newsletter writer, is absolutely loving it. The format as well, when you publish, um, obviously you guys have concentrated on this a lot because it just looks so much better than everything else on the market from our opinion. Don't like, trust me, we, we looked everywhere. We've tried, we've looked at absolutely every single one, the formatting, the writing it up, the drafting, absolutely everything's just great for it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're super, super happy, even though we've, we've only published two for, for you guys up to now, the migration was it was idiot proof <laughs> to put it, put it, yeah, we, we built cool. So like, again, like, entering the market and just thinking how we're prioritizing building the product, just knowing where we are, like we, like Substack has a six year head start on us. And as do these other platforms, like Mailchimp has been around for like 20 years or so. And so one of the top things we prioritize is knowing that most newsletters are already sending on another platform. One of the top things we need to build is a tool to import your content and your subscribers. So 
one click, here's my Substack URL. We pull in all the content. You can upload your CSV of emails, it takes five minutes. And even if you have, and I didn't hit on this and going over the features, but you can also launch a premium paid newsletter as well on Beehive. We don't take a cut of subscription revenue. So you charge $10 a month, you get just about $10. It's minus the Stripe fees. Um, and so we handle all of like the user authentication, the Stripe, the payments, the payouts, the paywalling, um, that the upselling, everything you can offer like promo codes and free trials. And so we can also migrate premium subscriptions from Substack or ConvertKit or any other platform with zero disruption to your readers. So they don't know that you're switching platforms. So we, we've thought through all of that in terms of like growth and making it as frictionless as possible to get new users on the platform. Yeah, Daniel took us through the, the tutorial when me and Dan uh, jumped on, but even down to the this calendar, if you switch, if you go down to the newsletter solutions, monetize and subscriptions, uh, and you can kind of have a play around with this with this slider. If you were to, if you wanted to go down the monetization route for paid subscribers, maybe you're going to get some power users or. A lot of people have some quite strong communities in um, the whole crypto and Web3 space. And definitely, um, I know for a fine fact, there's some relatively big newsletters, like 80, 100,000 that do have um, a paid newsletter with a small portion. So if you're listening, I'm going to send it over. I know exactly who I'm thinking of here, but um, maybe they should be looking at this as well. As you say, don't take any fees, just a Stripe transaction and things like that. So that's that's really interesting. Um, yeah. And I also didn't hit on like outside of just the subscriptions, like we also launched an ad network as well. And so we have dozens of like pretty well-known advertisers launching or have already launched campaigns on our platform. They give us the target demographic that they're looking to target. And we find the newsletters that have a high engagement and can optimize for basically just distributing ads, high quality ads to these different newsletters where they don't have to do the selling they don't have to do the copywriting. They don't have to do the tests and the reporting and the invoicing. We basically automate that entire process. So whether you're looking for subscription revenue and go paid, or you want to be free and monetize via ads or both, you can do either or both. And so uh, we have all of that built out as well. Awesome. Yeah, so I've just got a couple of features. And from a selfish perspective, I want your opinion and advice um <laughs> and then we can also highlight the features of it so the referral system we absolutely love it um what we wanted to do initially is just try and test it with some basic stuff like um we have a maybe like a quarterly report and only allow people who've referred one cust one one subscriber to gain access to that then further afield as we get a bit more exotic um kind of staggering it so if people refer one or if they refer five then the kind of incentive increases. Um, maybe we open up a private channel for people who've got five people to refer in our Discord or even further afield. Um, we, we will have um, a paid um, content wall on the new channel, maybe like 10% of all content that we're going to be drafting up will be behind this kind of paid content wall. So if people get 10 referrals or 15 referrals, maybe we can do it quarterly or annually free subscription through there. So is there any kind of inventive ways and is it easier to go with more digitized products or kind of physical products for these kind of incentives? Yeah, for sure. So I've, I've given a few different case studies on this and like walked through the strategy a bunch. I'd say one way to think about the incentives and rewards is understand why your audience signed up to your newsletter in the first place. And so at Morning Brew, we would always do different surveys of like, here's like 15 rewards. Some are real rewards that we already had. Others were like ones that we were considering and we'd have our readers like stack rank them. And the one that always came out on top was it, we, they've, they've retired it, but light roast, which was a premium Sunday newsletter. And so morning brew way back when sent Monday through Friday. And then we had a yeah. Sunday newsletter that we branded as like an exclusive only for people that have three referrals, like power morning brew readers would receive the Sunday newsletter. And so it made perfect sense from the alignment of incentives of they signed up to morning brew because they want to be in the know, stay on top of the news and like understand what's going on in the business world. And so by packaging this like Sunday exclusive newsletter, it was more of what you've already kind of incentivized, like why you signed up in the first place and you brand it as like an exclusive ordeal. And so we ended up having, 
I think when I left about 120,000 people on that email list and you needed three referrals to gain access. So we had like a top, I don't know, 5% in the world size newsletter. And it was all just consisting of people that had three plus subscribe or referrals. So 360,000 signups from those readers alone, at least. Um, so that was a great case study in terms of just aligning incentives. If you have the brand recognition to do merch and whatever other physical goods, I think it can work. There's obviously a cost associated with physical goods. There's like actually creating the goods, there's the shipping. And then there's also just like the things that people don't think about, which is like the operational aspect and customer support of people saying, hey, I haven't received that in the mail yet. And then your mm -hmm. writers or growth team, instead of focusing on growing the newsletter or writing, is like one UPS website trying to figure out and track down this package of why it didn't get delivered to your readers. And then they get all pissed off. So yeah. to answer your question a little bit more straightforward, like digital goods are amazing because you don't have to deal with shipping. They're typically cheaper. And like there's typically a sunk cost initially, and then it's fixed and it's all upside. So if you create a PDF of what's going on in the crypto industry or some other sort of digital asset, you create it once and you distribute it to everyone who hits that threshold and like that referral milestone. Like it's all, you know, free on top of that outside of distributing it. So I, I'm a huge fan of like the digital goods that you just kind of have to really align like what would yeah. subscribers want. The, um, the community yeah. aspect's great too. And like you can set up with like webhooks and API, like five referrals, send them an invite to Discord or whatever else you want to do. So yeah, I, I think that that's like the top takeaways I got from Morning Brew. And then we also did a case study on Milk Road and they just did one referral, got you a PDF. So they had one reward at one referral. So as low of a bar as possible, as frictionless as possible, and like an immediate source of like gratification once you hit that referral. And they spent, I think, eight hours writing a PDF. And then that's all they've ever done. And it grew to over 20,000 referrals from that one PDF. Wow. So um, I think simple is usually better. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were saying that, I wonder where the kind of where that barrier to entry hits and where the incentivization kind of drops depending on what how many because like, surely someone's not going to go out and get you 10 referrals <laughs> or 20 referrals okay, so the biggest thing that our biggest takeaway from morning brew was the fact that the most difficult transition was from zero to one once they had one mm -hmm. referral it showed that they knew that the referral program existed it shows that they know how it works because they were able to get a referral and they got some sort of gratification of like an email or acknowledgement that they did refer someone successfully. And so once they understand that learned behavior and like, oh, actually that was really easy to get a referral, then you can treat them entirely different because they're aware of it and they know how to do it. And so what Morning Brew did almost comically was we'd run giveaways for like a MacBook Pro or some other like big high ticket event or event or ticket or, or whatever. And so with the MacBook Pro, like who wouldn't want a MacBook Pro? We only bought one to give away. But what it did was maybe people who weren't incentivized by the exclusive newsletter or the t-shirt or the mug, they were incentivized by a free new computer. Mm -hmm. And so that would force a lot of people who were otherwise ignoring the referral program to at least get in the behavior of trying it out with the hopes and like the one in 10,000 chance that they did win a MacBook Pro. And so that was like a really interesting lever to help get more people involved into the ecosystem. Nice. Nice. Love that. So um, how do you think about feedback systems? We've got a small kind of survey. I'll show you what we've kind of got going on now. The bottom of uh, the newsletter, but this always stood out to me on the, on the milk, on the milk roads um, newsletter that how there was nothing, nothing over the top. Um, how was your today's edition? Totally awesome. Uh, nothing, nothing special. You wrote me. So how, how does, from from your perspective, how how does that feed in? Is it to be able to tailor content to how people are receiving it and their feedback from there or um, just general kind of feedback mechanisms? Yeah, I think that is like a great baseline. I think it pro like where I think Milk Road did an incredible job, and I don't know if they started this or they got it from someone else, but by featuring a few pieces of a feedback from the day prior's feedback, 
So they would always, they get like very funny submissions. And like part of this polling feature is like, yes, it's one click. You can click like totally awesome. But then it also redirects to a page that allows you to type in like a qualitative response. And so you could be like, I absolutely like love that first story. Um, and so you can add additional feedback and then grant as like the user for, for block mates can see what everyone wrote in like the qualitative responses and filter based on that. And so what Milk Road did very smartly is feature like four or five pretty funny responses from the day before, which <laughs> then encourages people to want to be, to want to respond something kind of funny in hopes that they are featured in the next day. So it has like this virtuous cycle of both encouraging more people to respond and probably more people to open the following day because they're curious whether or not they're going to be featured. And so there's like a lot of like feedback loops there, which I, I don't know how helpful that becomes then for actually getting useful data out of the poll, but it definitely boosts engagement. Um, another thing that works really well, like I've seen a lot of people use polls for specific stories. So if they test different types of content, being like, hey, this was like a new type of story. Did you like this? Yes, no. So it's a little bit more specific towards a particular section in the newsletter or like different themes or topics or stories that you're covering. Um, I do think like just having a very basic poll at the bottom of every newsletter can get a little bit repetitive um, and people probably start to mute it out unless you do something creative with it. Um, also, I was just playing around in the new editor all day. And so now that I see the old editor, it looks like such a piece of shit. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to get the new editor. Um, so hopefully when everyone watches this, it's like, this is like the retro old, old beehive before 100 KMRR and post 100 is like a whole new world. Um, so I'm pretty excited <laughs> about that. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, yeah, the poll feature is awesome. Like people use it in a lot of different clever and creative ways. Another thing that's a little bit less systematic, but for like email deliverability purposes, we would always do it at morning brew. We'd like ask like different questions or prompts at the top of the newsletter, like maybe once a week to encourage replies. And so from without needing to nerd out on email deliverability replies are like a very strong signal to like Gmail and all of the inbox providers that people want your mail because not only are they opening mm -hmm. it, but they're replying to it. And so it's a like very, very strong signal. So it's good for deliverability purposes to get your email in the primary inbox more. And then it also builds like a more tangible relationship with the readers. If you do have, whether the writers or interns or whoever respond back to the replies, one, it's just great for like user engagement and retention and building yeah. that relationship, but it's also great for email deliverability. So I think the combination of the polls and prompting for replies is like a great one two punch to get feedback and see what's working. Awesome. Awesome. Um, do you have any, you might be slightly biased on this, but do you have any preference on having the newsletter on a on its own beehive allocated landing page or through its own website we're currently going through a big website build and it's part of the reason we have to jump to you guys is because we want to integrate it in directly into the website and have like a nice flashy landing page on the newsletter section um do you think there's any conversion benefits or reasons to have on host through you guys for a website or just host directly through whatever website provider you're using yeah. I mean, I'd say like, obviously, well, one, I, the first eight to 10 months of Beehive was primarily focused on newsletter. I like as even our largest, most established media brands and newsletters, like 90% plus of their impressions come from newsletters for like the purpose that they're using us. And so while it's nice and flashy to have a great website, we just prioritized due to bandwidth, email focus and growth tactics and data over the website that's starting to change. Like we're investing a lot of time and we have a lot of really cool initiatives for the website. That being said, like we will never, uh, I won't say never, but anytime in the next year plus have the same flexibility and openness of like a WordPress or Webflow, where they're multi-billion dollar companies or organizations mm -hmm. focused on just like web experiences and plugins and everything there. So like, if you want a custom, a full custom website experience with like video and like, different like animations and everything else. Like I don't think Beehive, at least in its current form is like best for that. We are great for depending on the strengths and weaknesses of your team is what I always say is considering like, if you have a two person team that's writing content, do you really want to outsource or hire a developer to build 
like an SEO optimized website that's optimized for conversion that can track where subscribers are coming from, what the conversion rates are, where subscribers are more likely to engage and have like the images and videos and assets all render properly. And like, if that's in your wheelhouse and you have the bandwidth and skills or money to hire someone to do that, and you do have the aspirations of like a full web ecosystem, then I for sure go for that. We won't be able to match that functionality. But if you just want to focus on creating a incredible newsletter, writing content and allowing us to do things that we know that works well, which is we know how to host a website, make it very performant, have it optimized for email conversion, make sure that the images are resized and that they're in the right format and that the content's going to load and you can do the pop-up forms and email collection and everything else. Like that is kind of like our sweet spot of you know, something that you don't need to focus on, I'd say. And so there's kind of like a trade-off mm -hmm. there. And there's also, it's also like a function of time. Like the longer that we are a company and we get more and more feedback of, Hey, can you add custom navigation? Can I add an author page? Can I add an about page? Can I have search functionality that does X, Y, Z? Can I try these different layouts? Like we are always taking input from user feedback and building additional features based on that feedback. And so it is like a matter of time until like our web experience becomes very advanced and customizable, but probably nowhere in the next three to four months and definitely in the night, the next year will we compete with a WordPress, but that's also why we're investing in RSS APIs and everything else where you could have your own web ecosystem on a WordPress site or a custom built website and pull in content, send subscribers to us, use web hooks and API to be able to do what you need to do. And that is different from a lot of the other email players that are kind of like a closed ecosystem. And so we're trying to do the best of both worlds, have a really advanced web offering. But if you choose not to also play very nice with all the big web players as well. Yeah, nice, nice. Can we get into, we've only just tested this feature out, but the AB testing for, um, for your headlines effectively. Let me see if I can find that on here. Yeah, I thought so we only saw it. Uh, might be a different might be a different post yeah that's the one you just created you can go view all or yeah one of those right there a b test yeah so we we tested tested with a small sample size but um i don't think we had uh titles are very similar to be honest but we, i don't think we had st statistical significance but just the idea that we can do this is really really great because me and dan are always arguing about how do we create um, clickable titles that aren't over the top clickbaity, but you know, we need to get conversion and clicks at the same time as well. So I think me and Dan might have a competition going on here with the AB testing. Uh, I love yeah. this feature. I think it's great. Well, we would always do stuff like that at Morning Brew too, where we would always debate which subject line and like bet on which subject line we thought was going to win. And so totally different as well. Like when we were at like a million to 2 million emails, we would just sample like 5% of the list. And we also did like ABCD testing. So four different subject line variants, which you can also do mm. in Beehive. And so any given day, we had four different subject lines going out. And I'd say the difference between first place and fourth place can be upwards of like three and a half, four percent 4%, which depending on your, like at morning brew size, like three and a half, four percent 4% is a lot. Is a lot. <laughs> um, and, and especially as like an ad based model, like the difference of 40,000 additional people opening your newsletter makes a big difference in what you're charging advertisers. So it ended up being like a very meaningful over the course of a year. Like you're talking millions of additional impressions that you were making off of ads through A-B testing. And so, yeah, that that's like a pretty big feature that we got out earlier, I guess last year now. Um, but yeah. Yeah, nice, nice. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. Just want to touch on one final point and then we can wrap up. Monetization through Beehive, third party in house ad networks that you guys are building or monetization directly. Is there is your preference on your end or is there is there a right or wrong way? Is it know your audience and know what they want? How, how, do, how do you guys kind of look at that? Yeah. It's probably what you, the last thing you said, know your audience and know what they want. Like for me personally, I don't give a shit. Like for the way that I've always thought about it is like whatever is best for our users, I don't want to impose our business model or 
what is better for us as a business as what we're pushing on our users. And so, for example, there are certain platforms where they only make money off of subscription revenue. And so it makes sense that they favor and push users who have a premium subscription because that's where they make their cut. And large free newsletters or ad-based newsletters do absolutely nothing for them. And so we're actually the inverse, right? Like we don't take a cut of subscription revenue because we don't think like we charge a flat rate SaaS fee and the service that we provide you, whether you have 10 paying subscribers or 10,000 paying subscribers doesn't really change for us. And so we don't think we should take a cut of your subscription revenue. Um, mm -hmm. So we have like very predictable flat rate pricing. And we think that's better for the content creator where we do take a cut of, of ad revenue because we're doing like the sourcing of ads and all of the logistical work in between. But that doesn't mean we're like forcing ads through like all of our newsletters. We think it's a value add where a lot of these newsletters are one, two, three, four person teams who don't have a dedicated seller. And so that, that team is focused on writing content and growing the newsletter with absolutely no work outside of saying, yes, we can place high quality ads in your newsletter. And as long as it aligns with your vision and brand and everything else, you're now monetizing without having a salesperson or needing to do any lift or work on your end. So like, I think it's like a tremendous value add where charging for subscription revenue is just syncing up Stripe and being a middleman and just taking a fee for being a middleman, which I'm not a huge fan of in that model. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, whether you run affiliates, ads, subscriptions, tips, anything, it, it's really like our, what is best for us is the success of our content creators and newsletters. And as long as they're growing and finding ways to monetize effectively and they can pay themselves and reinvest in growth, like that's better for us to build success stories versus us trying to extract money wherever we can from mm -hmm. our users. Yeah, completely agree with that. I mean, my perspective on the vast majority of everything is just try and give as, as much away for free as possible. Because I think particularly in the space that um, we operate in, in the crypto and Web3 space, there's en enough stupid money sloshing around for extremely overvalued companies that we don't necessarily have to go direct to the reader to be asking them to kind of foot the bill to keep our lights on effectively. So we always want to work B2B. Um, work on sponsorship, work on partnerships and go down that route. As I say, on the on the new website, we will have a, a more kind of premium content thing, but I think that's going to be really, really low barrier to entry for cost. Um, but yeah, um, we're going to throw the kitchen sink at this from paid acquisition and absolutely everything this year. We want to we wanna be one of your next success stories le leading on from the Milk Road, how successful that was. Love what Sean's done there. Um, obviously, you guys have done an incredible job as well. So um, hopefully... 12 months down the line, we have our, uh, a similar sort of success story coming out of the Blockmates camp. But um, if there was one platform to do it, we took a look around and um, we were all hell bent on getting over to Beehive and trying to grow alongside you guys. So I um, want to thank you for your time and hopefully we can have another conversation, as I say, in 12 months' time. We're um, all very happy with how the process has went from both sides. Yeah, we, we just saw through your demo how the, how big the list is now. Let's do it again in 12 months, and hopefully it's 10x that, 20x that at least, um, and hopefully a, another huge success story. So looking forward to awesome. it. Yeah. Um, just, just one final thing. How did you guys just get um, money thrown at you in the beginning, or was it a difficult grind to get the fundraising over the line? Or so I, I can imagine. I can imagine you guys are a future unicorn I'm not just saying that because you're here i think it's i think it's just a natural progression um so i just wondered how that looked yeah initial fundraising i think for most first time although like i did the failed company in college and start up with like morning brew i was not a founder but very early i guess technically like this was my first startup like in the real world outside of college and i feel like with most first time founders it's somewhat difficult to raise money I mean, we what we raised money summer of 2021, right when Facebook announced Bulletin and maybe eight to 10 months after Twitter acquired Revue. And so it's also funny saying that now that Bulletin and Revue have both shut down in the past probably six months. <laughs> but VC to see two of the largest tech companies, I don't know if Twitter is one of the largest, but Facebook for sure. And then Twitter like demands a lot of space and, and authority. And so... To have both of them launch a newsletter competitor, and there's already Substack as the clear market leader. ConvertKit's been around for like 10 years. 
MailChimp's the behemoth. Um, and a bunch of others in between. It's like a very competitive space, like very saturated. And so while most of those players are more focused on e-commerce and marketing emails, and we're like strictly on like content-based newsletters, um, not easy raising money in such a competitive space when there is a clear market leader. And then also there's always talk of like, is email dead? Is there like newsletter fatigue? How many newsletters actually are there? And like one of my favorite things is, is Ben Thompson of Stratechery quoted that the internet's always so much bigger than people give it credit for. And like every day when I see these sign up, like we're, we're seeing over a thousand signups a day some days and the newsletter categories and content and topics coming in are so out there that you like would never think that there's a community of 2000 people who would sign up for that, but there is. And like, we're also not just going after the long tail content creators. We're going after the next wave of morning brews, whether it's like a milk road fantasy life, which is a huge fantasy sports newsletter. Um, there's a bunch of like an up and coming wave of newsletters that are building a real business around their newsletter. And like, that's who we're targeting, not necessarily just the long tail content creator. Uh, but to answer your question directly, not super easy. Now we're at a point where we're probably two months away from profitability. And there's definitely investors who reach out pretty frequently to try to get involved. <laughs> and now it's really great to tell them that we're not really interested. We're just building and trying to build a property. <laughs> yeah. Where were you at the beginning? <laughs> no, I bet that's yeah. a good feeling. Um, yeah. Awesome. Tyler, thank you very much. Um, as I say, I hope you can have another conversation in 12 months and we far exceed your 20X. Um, and hopefully, yeah, see what we can do together in the future. But um, yeah, once again, Thank you very much. I know it's getting getting late over your end, so um, yeah. might as well get back to answer some of those support tickets. <laughs> yeah, I'm on it. Don't worry. Thank you, Grant. Take it easy, man. <laughs> All right, take it easy, bud. Bye.